Hello and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. Today we're privileged to have Dr. Stephen Bryan speak to us. He's a leading expert in security strategy and technology. He's held senior positions in the Department of Defense on Capitol Hill and as the president of a large multinational defense and technology company. Currently, Dr. Bryan is a senior fellow at the American Center for Democracy, the Center for Security Policy. He has served as a senior staff director of the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as the executive director of a grassroots political organization, as the head of the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, as deputy under secretary of defense for trade security policy, and as the founder and first director of the Defense Technology Security Administration. He is the author of Technology Security and National Power, Winners and Losers, and of three volumes of essays in technology, security, and strategy. Dr. Bryan was twice awarded the Defense Department's highest civilian honor, the Distinguished Service Medal. Recently, the United States and the United Kingdom intelligence agencies have said the Russian military hackers over the last several years have tried to access the computer networks of hundreds of government and private sector targets worldwide and warned that those efforts are almost certainly still going on. Also, the United States, together with NATO, the European Union, Australia, Britain, Canada, Japan, and New Zealand have accused China of a global cyber espionage campaign. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said it posed, quote, a major threat to our economic and national security, unquote. Dr. Bryan is going to address the underlying technology security and cyber insecurity of our situation today. Welcome to the Westminster Institute. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Appreciate the, the opportunity to speak to you and your audience. Um, I'll give you some a little bit of background. My my first book is the one you didn't mention. Um, it's called The Application of Cybernetic Analysis to the Study of International Politics. When I wrote that book and, and uh, brought it to my mother, she looked at it and said, what else do you do that's useful? <laughs> <laughs> she was not impressed. Um, and that was back, uh, the book was published in 1970, but I wrote it around 67 and 68. So I've been at this for a long time. I, 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 am, I am not a uh, whiz kid technologist. I would like to be, but uh, I can program. But my programming goes back to the 1960s and I did Fortran 4. So that's an obsolete uh, language, programming language. Um, and I taught it uh, when I was a professor at Lehigh University. So I have, a, you know, I have a lot of hands-on with com uh, computers, electronics, and, and the implications. To your main point, which we'll discuss uh, in more depth, a lot more depth as we move along today. Um, the situation is, is pretty grave right now. Uh, that is to say that most of our computer networks public and private in the US and, and among our allies and friends, all of them are uh, at high risk, not low risk, but high risk. And I don't think right now that anyone has a very good answer on what to do about it. And there's some reasons behind that. So with that said, let me put up my presentation to start the first few slides uh, to introduce the subject more uh, precisely. What I want to say first is the U.S. has become vulnerable to unprecedented threats to its information, command and control, and weapon systems security, all of which rest on cyber networks. And despite years of trying and billions in investment, and, and the billions keep rising, our military forces, our national command structure, indeed the entire critical infrastructure of our country is at severe risk. President Biden today proposed at a, on a voluntary basis that the critical infrastructure segments of our 
country, just things like communications, uh, transportation, um, uh, banking and finance, water supply, electrical power, um, and so on. These, these, uh, uh, what, what these people should do is to improve their security. The problem is they can't improve their security. And that, that, that they try, but it doesn't really work very well. And I think that's, that's the problem. And, and beyond that, the government is saying voluntary, if you can do it, because 95% of the U.S. critical infrastructure is in private hands. It's not, it's not owned by the government. The government has no share in it, so, which is unusual for most countries because in, in, in many other places, the UK or France or Germany or Japan or anywhere you go, uh, many of the key cyber institutions such as uh, telephone network are owned by the, you know, owned by the government. So the president understands there's a big problem. The CIA, NSA, and the FBI have all gotten together and said there's a big problem just last week and published a report in which they said the problem is China, mainly, although the problem is also Russia, and the problem is also Iran. And there's a report out today on Iran. The problem is also North Korea. So it doesn't stop it in, in, in one, necessarily in one place, but I think uh, of all of them, China is probably the most dangerous because uh, they have developed a very sophisticated system of stealing information from the U.S. and from our allies. And, and they do it with ferocity and with cleverness and, and they're effective. I'm concerned about our war fighting systems and our capabilities militarily because uh, First of all, that's how we defend our country and how we def help defend our allies and friends. And we send our, our, our boys and girls, if I may use it, that term. I think that's probably a pejorative term now. But anyway, we send our boys and girls, like my daughter, who's a lieutenant colonel in the army, we, we, we send them off to war and you know the risks for them are getting greater and greater. Now, I go back a long way, as I said at the beginning, but let me talk a little bit about what happened in the 1980s in the U.S. Defense Department, where I was in the Reagan administrations, two of them. And the decision was made to start using what are called commercial off-the-shelf systems, COTS. And before that, the government mostly was using uh, custom-built computers and electronics uh, built to government specifications. But it, those were expensive. Uh, they weren't all that advanced. The commercial stuff was evolving very fast. And DOD said, DOD being the Defense Department said, you know, let's just buy IBM desktops or other, or desktops from Dell and other companies that were now, that were at that time emerging. And what's happened over time is that virtually all the computers and all the desktop machines and all the networks, all the modems and all the stuff that is used by our government and by our military is virtually all of it commercial. And, and I call that a fateful, a fateful decision. Now in 1986, there was a guy named Clifford Stoll. He's an, he's an astronomer, actually an astrophysicist. And he was at the uh, at University of Berkeley. And because his grant had fallen through to do some more astrophysical studies, he got a temporary job in the computer lab at Berkeley, minding a very early computer system that they had that happened to be connected to the Defense Department, among other places. And as he was trying to learn the system and understand, he came across a, a 75 cent charge that no one paid. And being curious, he started to look into the 75 cent charge and try to figure out what was, who, who it was. And he finally tracked it down to Hanover, Germany. And there was a guy in Hanover, Germany, who was not only not paying his bills, but he was using 
the Berkeley computer as a way to get into the US Defense Department. And he was taking thousands of documents out through this old, and this is a very old fashioned network, but through this network using what have disappeared today, which were acoustic, acoustic modems. You may remember those. You put your telephone into a little cradle and your computer went with a lot of funny noises and your computer connected up and very slowly you could send data back and forth. And that's what he was doing. More than that, he was working for the KGB. And Cliff went over to the, you know, Cliff is, he does, may not look like a patriot, but he is a patriot. He went to NSA and he said, hey, I just discovered this. And they weren't interested. <laughs> and they went to the CIA, they weren't interested. So it took a lot of time for them to understand what was really going on. And what was happening then is still happening, except the scale is, you know, hugely greater. What you can send over a 1200 baud modem is very little compared to what you can send over a high-speed internet connection today, where you can send gigabytes worth of information. And, and that's essentially what's being taken out of our system. And, and much of it is intellectual property. And the rest of it is plans and programs and, and, and that kind of information. And even more of it's personal, personal information. I don't know, Bob, whether you uh, were caught up in the... Uh, hack of the uh, uh, US uh, security clearance databases that were stolen, presumably by the Chinese, or may have been someone else, but we're pretty sure it's the Chinese. I was. Yeah, me too. I got one of these nice notifications that says, you've been, your information has been stolen. Uh, they know everything there is to know about you. But don't worry, we'll give you a free one year subscription to, to some nonsense. It's going to protect me from what? They've already ripped me off. So, you know, this government, uh, we used to have a joke and said, I'm from, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. And everybody runs away, uh, and rightfully so. In any case, um, the, the, these are serious things. I did want to mention one thing, which is a, a huge problem of the information that was uh, uh, stolen, yours and mine, and, and 21 and a half million other people. That information was on an unclassified network. In other words, all that, all your, you, when you filled out that security application, the government said that's not classified information. We put it into the unclassified box, which means the level of protection for that kind of information is, shall we say, low to non-existent, very little, if any. The government has this curious system of classified and unclassified, all of it is, uh, virtually all of it is sensitive data. It includes other things you might not think about. The health information, the, it's covered by HIPAA, the, the, but in fact, health information is not, it's not classified. And so it's not encrypted, it's not protected. Uh, law enforcement information is not encrypted. So FBI files, for example, can be accessed without needing a security clearance. Uh, let's see if I can move on. And these are some of the guys who access it. I just thought I'd put three of the four of them, the pictures. The Chinese have put together a, a formidable team of, of individuals, well-trained linguistic, uh, linguistically capable, um, and th they work for the for the uh, People's Liberation Army. That's who they work for, and and what the Chinese tend to do is hand off the acquisition tasks as the stealing part to third parties, and the Russians do it the same way too. By the way, very often they don't steal it themselves; they get people to steal it for them. Going back to the Clifford Stoll discussion, the guy in Hanover was a German citizen. He wasn't a member of the Communist Party or anything like that. He was just a German citizen who was being paid. And, and you know, now we have more sophisticated things going on like ransomware and all that. But these are people who are being paid to do what they're doing by foreign governments. That's the key point. 
And I think that if you understand that, you can understand why it's so difficult to, to try and so, try and stop it because it's you, you may be able to track down an individual or even a group of individuals, but you're, you're, it's hard to prove that a foreign government did it. And even if you can prove it, what are you going to do about it? Now, another vulnerability, aside from the kind of data that we think of, are what are called SCADA systems. Are you familiar with SCADA systems? These, these are, the, the, the term means supervisory control and data acquisition systems. These are systems that manage networks, manufacturing, energy networks, oil and natural gas, transportation networks like your, your uh, uh, trains and aircraft, uh, many critical infrastructure tasks, but they also manage command and control systems in the military. They manage uh, the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance facilities. Uh, they're, they're extremely important. And almost all the SCADA systems that are out there today, bar no, first, they're all commercial. There are, no, there are no proprietary ones. They're all commercial systems. All the information about how they work is published. Um, and they all have very significant vulnerabilities. Now, the companies that make them, some of them are very prominent companies like Siemens, uh, try to update them and try to fix them when they know about a, a vulnerability. But they're usually way behind the power curve. And even if they update it, that update has to get back to the, the users and the users have to put that update into effect and hope that they haven't been hacked before. And one of the things that the Chinese specialize in is they learn about a vulnerability because some technical uh, genius says, oh, I found a vulnerability in, this, in the Siemens uh, SCADA controller, and it's this. And the Chinese immediately jump on that, and they go to every SCADA system they can find in the world and see if they can exploit it. And, and we're not immune to doing it to people we don't like either, I mean, <laughs> to be honest. So it's, it's a kind of free-for-all. But it's extraordinarily important when you think about that our command control communications computers uh, used by the, the, the Defense Department, by the Air Force, the, especially the Air Force, the Army and the Navy, that all those can be, can be hit by uh, malware of one kind or another or intrusions of one kind or another that can either render them inoperative or change the parameters of what they're reporting. So we've seen cases, for example, where uh, toxic, toxic materials that are used to disinfect water have been released into the water supply by intruders, hackers, in a number of countries, including uh, uh, Rome, Italy, and including Israel, successfully, and once in the US. Uh, so they take chlorine, which is a disinfectant, and instead of releasing it in, in small amounts, they, they release a massive amount by fooling the controller to do that. And no one knows it until it's, it's already in the water supply. But that's just one example that just shows you how vulnerable we are. Now, these are just some of the risks. So I think I've given you enough of that. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time except to say that not only foreign governments can do it, but terrorists can do it. This is, this is a wide open field and it's, and it's easy to see how, you know, a smart, uh, let's say uh, uh, ISIS recruit who's computer trained, maybe at Berkeley <laughs> or some other august institution who becomes, who becomes uh, capable of writing code and writing malware, for example, or, or carrying out a, a intrusion into a foreign system, that he can do this on behalf of, of Al-Qaeda or ISIS or whoever he's working for. Now, in, in a little type here on the screen, I also wrote Stuxnet. Now, Stuxnet, if you recall, was a, a form of, uh, of ma let's call it malware, it's more than malware, it's really a Trojan, that was uh, introduced into Iranian centrifuges in a project that was managed by the, by the 
uh, U.S. government and by the Israeli government that, that managed to knock off uh, for a while a number of uh, uh, Iranian centrifuges and more than that, to spin them up at such a high rate of speed that they, <clears throat> that they failed and they to self-destructed. Interesting part about it is that the bug was introduced through an update to a Siemens, to a Siemens uh, uh, update of its SCADA software. So that's how they do it. It's one of the ways. And it's effective. Now, the other topic that fits into this today, more and more, is the Internet of Things, or IoT. This chart is kind of ugly. But nowadays, your television, your washing machine, your printer, your, your, your lights, your doorbell, your surveillance camera, if you have one, your webcam, uh, all these things and much, much more have a connection to the internet. And, and because they have a connection in the internet, it's possible to bugger them. And you say, well, that doesn't really affect uh, national security. Well, it does because how many televisions are there in various military bases that have a camera and a microphone in them? And where are they located? And, some of them are just in a meeting hall or someplace that's not so important, but some of them are in, you know, command and control facilities. And you don't know when it's been turned on because it has a back door. It's very, it's a very serious problem. It's a few years ago, I blew the whistle on a State Department uh, RFP. It was actually a sole source request for proposal uh, that the State Department put out for cameras for the U.S., embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. And they were buying on sole source Chinese cameras. And not only Chinese cameras, that's bad enough, but they were buying Chinese cameras with known security uh, vulnerabilities, including what we call a back door. And that is the ability, the ability to look behind uh, and find, you know, turn the camera on at will and watch what's going on or fool the camera because the cameras usually go back to a, a security control panel where people are watching to see what's going on, whether there's been an intrusion. And one of the tricks is to put up an old picture of a meeting room, which is empty, when in fact it's not empty, there are people in it. Um, and, and therefore you can steal things and do things. Um, and, and, and the security uh, monitoring team has no idea. So that, that's a, a, a problem. The other problem that, that is increasingly uh, challenging are these things, cell phones. These are, uh, these are quite powerful computers. They have five different radios in them. They have GPS connections, a global positioning system. So if they're on, people know where you are. Uh, they have microphones, they have cameras, more than one camera, most of them. Some have, mine has four. Um, I bought the premium model. But, <laughs> but in any case, uh, these are extremely powerful and totally insecure, totally insecure. And almost all of them are made in China. Or if you're lucky, part of them are made in, in South Korea or Taiwan. But by and large, most of them, for example, the Apple iPhone is made entirely in China by a company called Foxconn. And Foxconn is owned by Hanhei Precision. It's actually a Taiwanese-owned company, but its main business is in China. It has a million employees in China. So if, if, you, if you have nefarious characters who are trying to, to slip in some uh, software backdoors or other uh, ways for intruders to get in uh, above and beyond what we know about, it's a perfect place where it can happen. There is no security about these things. There's no security about smartwatches. There's no security about cell phones. There's no security about webcams. There's no, no security about surveillance cameras. Um, they're, they're, they're wide open and, and very few of the manufacturers take security seriously. And yet they're, they're used everywhere in our society, not just, not just uh, that, in your home or in your school or in your office, but it's used by the military, by government. 
Now, I just want to give you some quick statistics. Most important thing, I think, is that while we're seeing a, a massive increase in the amount of hacking that's going on today, most, mostly, mostly the hacks that, that occur are just stealing, either for financial reasons or for political reasons or military reasons. Some of them are designed for even more serious uh, kinds of attacks. Um, let me talk a little bit about that. But before I do, there's one other point. The US government says that we should report to the government about any intrusion that we detect. The problem is that mostly intrusions aren't detected until they've been uh, hacking away for quite a long time, sometimes years, often months. And it's very rare to catch them in the act on the first try. And, and so what, what happens is, first of all, that the system is biased. The system as it is, is biased against detection. The second problem is it's very difficult for a private business, especially business that's traded on the stock market, to reveal that they've been seriously hacked. Because if they reveal that they've been seriously hacked, it could affect their stock price. Banks in particular are very reluctant to declare that they've lost maybe a billion dollars. They'd rather wait it out and hope that they can cover it somehow and maybe it'll go away. And the same thing happens with ransomware. Ransomware, as you probably know, is, is a trick. It's a dirty trick where an intruder will encrypt all your data so that you can't access it. It's impossible to access it. And then he will send you a polite note that says, for $5 million, I will unencrypt what's encrypted. And if you don't pay me, then too bad. I'm not going to ever decrypt it. And today, encryption, even commercial encryption, is good enough that it's probably impossible to break it, or at least very, very time-consuming and expensive. And meanwhile, your operations are disrupted. So whether it's an oil pipeline, which we've seen, the natural gas pipeline, or whether it's you know a, a banking system or whatever it is, it, it's extremely troublesome for companies. And, and if the fine, or fine, the, the, the bribe or whatever you want to call it, the ransom is within reach financially, they often just decide, let's pay it. Let's, you know, because if we call the FBI and they get in it, it's going to be a long drawn out mess. And at the end of the day, we may not get what we want back the way we want it. For example, the Colonial Pipeline, which was an East Coast pipeline that was disrupted by ransomware, never actually was able to fully recover all the data that they lost. It, it had been corrupted by the encryption method that was used by the hackers, and it wasn't recoverable. So even though they paid, I think, $5 million, and may have been plus or minus that, but more or less in that ballpark, even though they paid the bill after consulting with the FBI and consulting with other government agencies and finding out that the U.S. government couldn't help them, that even then, after they paid, it didn't get fixed. So uh, something to keep in mind. I think it's an important feature of, of uh, this sort of thing. And by the way, while we're at it, uh, the, the government also doesn't like to report uh, that it's been hacked for, for a lot of reasons. One is national security. For example, if somebody hacks uh, the Navy, or let's say uh, gets into the command and control system uh, of one of our nuclear submarines, and that's not an impossibility. That's not an impossibility. The, the Navy... The Navy doesn't necessarily want the world to know that they've been crippled in some serious way. So they tend to hide this sort of information. Internally, also, they tend to hide it because if they've been hacked, you know, who's responsible? Who takes the hit? And, and what are the consequences? You could, you know, the commander could lose his job. Uh, an assistant secretary could find himself selling oranges in front of the White House. So <laughs> maybe that's a good thing, but 
but in any case, it's it's a it's a it's a definite. Uh, there's not a good incentive for them to report it. There's no incentive to report it, and so they don't. I want to talk a little bit about what can be done about this, because it's pretty clear that if we're going to rely entirely on commercial systems, as we are today, the chances of being able to secure commercial systems is pretty small. And a lot of reasons for that. First of all, companies, big companies, Microsoft, for example, Google, all these companies, that the Silicon Valley tribe, if you want, are not primarily interested in security. They're primarily interested in sales. And so a lot of what they're designing into these machines is, as my friend Jinjura Isamura in Japan says, is for entertainment, whether it's webcams like we're using now, or, or whether it's uh, music or whether, whatever it is, or even games. Uh, the fact is that they're designed for that purpose more than they're designed for high-level security. In fact, high-level security is an afterthought. So under the circumstances, that, that's one problem. The, another problem is that an operating system, like a computer operating system, lasts in the market three or four years before it's replaced. And during that time, it may receive 10, 20, or even more updates because some vulnerability has been found or some new feature has been added. So it's a constantly evolving system. We have nuclear submarines in the water today that are using Windows XT. Now, if you remember Windows XT, that goes back a while, about 15 years, I think. It's a very old operating system and, and one of the worst from a security point of view. But it's built into the submarine because the, the contractor decided to put it in there because it was easy to get and it worked. But the problem is that it's also a huge vulnerability. And you think it's just us? The British new uh, aircraft carrier, Queen Elizabeth, which they're right now is patrolling in the South China Sea, uh, also has Windows XT computers. And that's a brand new ship. Because, you know, in the defense, in the defense world, 12 to 15 years is not unusual for a weapon system to be developed and built. So if you freeze the design in 1990 and 2005, the thing is finally manufactured and put in the field and tested and all that. And by 2010, it's an accepted part of the system. Its electronics are, are absolutely ancient. Uh, back in the 80s, I... I Ask Bob Noyes. Bob Noyes was the co-founder of Intel. A great guy, a very important uh, man in Silicon Valley and, and a very important man because he was a patriot as well. And I said, Bob, I got a problem. Uh, they're having difficulty with the Minuteman system. That's, this is our strategic nuclear system uh, because the components in the Minuteman system are obsolete and they're not manufactured anymore. I mean, they just don't make them anymore. For example, I'll, tr I'll try to explain this in a clear way. The kind of uh, microchips that were in there were called single scale integrated circuits, which had up to 10 transistors on a chip, that's all. Today we have a billion transistors on a chip. In the eighties, we were already up to hundreds of thousands. And I said, Bob, what can we do? How can we get new chips for the Minuteman. And he, he went out and looked at the Minuteman and at my invitation, I was in the Pentagon then. And he came back and he said, it's, it's truly a sunset technology. It's really a shame. He said, because the right thing to do would be to rip the system out and replace it. But you're talking about tens and tens of billions of dollars and lots of time to do it. So you have a, you have a phenomenon where the, the, the government is using either really old stuff, not by choice, but because of the system itself 
the way the system works and how long it takes. This. Now it takes too long. But even if it took seven years or, or, uh, or five years, still a long, in computer terms, it's a long time. The computer on your desk probably would be replaced twice in that period. And, and, and uh, rightfully so, because the technology is rapidly evolving. So keeping up with security in this kind of situation is, is very difficult. And then we get to one other consideration. And the other consideration is what we call embedded systems. An embedded system is when you take a computer, I'll make pretend this is a computer, and you build it into a, a, a system because you need a computer there. But the computer is not standalone. It's just wired in as part of the circuitry. The problem is that, that when you put it in, in in 2000, in 2020, that thing is a, is an obsolete useless, from, the, from a commercial point of view, totally useless piece of junk. From a military point of view, they're going to live with it for another 20 years. You see what I mean? And if it's vulnerable, if it's full of holes, security holes, it's very hard to fix, if it can be fixed at all. So it's, it's clear that we, we really have to rethink how we do this, and especially in the government and military sector mm -hmm. and in the critical infrastructure because relying on the commercial equipment is very high risk and we have to find a way around it. So I've, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to know all the answers on that. I wish I did, but I, I have proposed that we form a national commission and we don't fill it up with techies. We fill it up with smart people who can think out of the box and can come up with an alternative to commercial systems. And there's another reason why this is so important. The same systems that the United States uses today, same computers, the same networks, the same, the same everything, is what the Chinese use and the Russians use and, and everybody else in the world is using. So there are no secrets. Everybody has time to play with this. So, some years ago, um, there was an explosive found inside of a printer ink uh, cartridge that got through security in Yemen of all places and was put on an airplane and it had a timer and it was supposed to explode over London. And the second one was supposed and another airplane was supposed to explode over Chicago. Uh, the good news is that the, the terrorists who did this were, were, were good at getting it stuck in there, but they weren't good at design. So they made some mistakes and, and the systems were finally discovered and the planes were asked to land um, in mid flight to certain places. And these printer cartridges, which were full of bomb, bomb material were removed and, and happily there was no bad thing happened. But the, the point is that, how did they do it? Well, they learned how the X-ray machines at the airport work because in Yemen, it was easy to get, you know, pay some bribes and work with the local guys and figure out where the holes were and how to get around it. And so they were able to smuggle the, because otherwise it would have been picked up by the, by the uh, metal detectors. Uh, and, and they were able to get these things in and into the cargo holds of these airplanes. The same thing is true of computers and, and all the rest that we all use. If everybody has access to them, they can figure out how to so-called beat the system, how to penetrate the system, and they can practice and practice and practice on their own stuff until they know how to do it. And then, of course, they turn around and, and we pay the price because they, they disrupt our you know, communications or our networks or our command and control systems or our ships or our aircraft or whatever or what have you. <coughs> so that's, <coughs> that's the dilemma. That's the dilemma. And the National Commission would be a way, at least in my humble opinion, it would be a way that, that we could try to find some alternatives to using commercial materials. Uh, in my own head, I think that we have to come up with the government, a, a restricted government system that is not based on commercial products, that does not use commercial software, that does not use commercial hardware as such and that has very high levels of security. And as remember, I talked about unclassified versus classified. The government as a whole has to work in a classified environment. 
this distinction between what's sensitive and not sensitive and how to figure that out, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a workable way to, to protect vital information. Because one of the reasons they steal personal information from individuals like you and me and others, engineers, scientists, decision makers, is to find ways to get in, get passwords, get information on how to penetrate systems and then to exploit it. And as long as they can do that, we're in a lot of trouble. But if they can't get that information, and by the way, I think there's pretty strong evidence to suggest that a lot of CIA operatives in China got exposed because of cyber insecurity and paid with it for the, with their lives. So it's, it's not just information, but it's lives. And it's lives not just in a war, because we're not in a war right now, more or less, but it, it's it's... It's also, you know, the people who keep us safe, who, who, who are willing to put their lives on the line to get it, to, to protect us. And, and, and CIA is, is part of that picture. So uh, we don't want them to, you know, we want them to be able to operate without being picked up. So bottom line here is that, is that we need to come up with a, a whole new approach and we need our, our, our government uh, to take this very seriously indeed. And, 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 and we need a national commission to design, to propose a design for a system that can quickly be put in place. It's not going to be a cheap and expensive uh, task. But on the other hand, maintaining the system we have is an expensive, terribly expensive task that can cost us billions of dollars in compromised systems. The F-35, and the F-22, which are, you know, vital to, to our Air Force uh, uh, stealth uh, uh, fighters, have been compromised almost completely, and the Chinese have copied most of the most of the critical components in those aircraft. The ones they could copy, they, some of them they couldn't because the the information the information that they really wanted, let's say on on aircraft engines, is not something you can get in one place, and it's a lot of there's a lot of uh, magic technology there but for the most part they copied quite a lot and and uh, and you can see it now because they're flying uh, uh the j20 which is a stealth uh, fighter bomber it looks a lot like the f-22 and they have a new one called the j31 which is a kind of a, a knockoff of uh, of the f-35 except it has two engines so i, I think i'll i'll uh, stop at this point uh, and invite some dialogue, if it's okay with you. Steve, thank you very much for that presentation. Secretary of State Blinken uh, mentioned not simply national security, but economic security. And whereas the Chinese have been able to uh, get the information to design their stealth aircraft, we know that they have either reverse engineered or gotten the blueprints for a lot of critical equipment in the commercial world right. from Germany and from the United States. So they don't have the capital expenditures uh, that would be required to develop these things in the first place. So then they, they make them and can undercut Western manufacturers and, and therefore take over entire industries. Do you have any comment about that? It's a multi-layered approach that the Chinese take. If, if, you're, if your intellectual property is accessible to them and they can copy it, they copy it. Uh, copying it may mean actually getting a, one of these, for example, and just taking it apart and copying it, the old fashioned way of exploiting something. Or it can mean stealing the designs and all the information you need to uh, to make your own. If you, when you're looking at, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, Silicon Valley companies are, are increasingly. It's interesting because they like to do business in China, but are increasingly worried that their good stuff is going to be ripped off by China, uh, and they're going to find themselves uh, competing against the Chinese in global markets. Good example of that are uh, microprocessors for computers uh, and these things. The Chinese are now copying some of the best ones in the marketplace. Um, 
and 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 they're not just copies. I want to be careful here. They're copies plus. In other words, they take they take the U.S. design and then they add their own twists and turns to it, uh, so they can say, well, it's not the same as yours. It's different. And then they go out in the marketplace and they sell computers or gadgets and you know Internet of Things stuff. Almost all Internet of Things stuff's made in China. I can't think of anything that's made anywhere else. It's almost all made in China. And, and, and they make this stuff and they sell this stuff and people buy it. And, and by the way, they sell cheap. And they also do the same thing in military. For example, uh, consider the Predator, you know, the US Predator, which is our, one of our most famous uh, drones, armed drones, you know, so the Reaper version is armed. Uh, they copied it. Now, where did they, did they, how did they do that? Uh, we don't know exactly, but I'd be pretty certain that they were able to hack General Atomics, who makes the makes the Predator, over time, and and were able to gather enough information to 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 copy everything that was in in that bird. And in fact, that UAV is you know a lot of it's not that special technology. It was the genius of putting it together was special. That was the smart thing. And they have their own version of it. it looks just like it, called Wing Loon. And Wing, Wing Loon, it's not just that the Chinese have it, but they're selling it even to some of our allies. The UAE has bought a lot of them. Saudi Arabia has bought a number of them. Egypt has bought them. And a number of Ukraine has bought them. So a number of countries have, have bought these things because they're a third of the price of Predator on one hand. And the U.S. won't sell them Predator that's armed anyway. The Chinese will sell it with all the missiles you want and bombs you want on it. So that's that's commercial, but it's also military, isn't it? It's a little bit of each. And uh, and, 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 and and they've been used in, in, in successfully in, in, in wars. I mean, they use them in Libya. The UAE have provided them to Haftar's forces in Libya. The Turks provided their own to the to the other to the Tripoli side. Uh, they use they've, they've sold them to the Ukrainians who use them to watch the Russians, um, and uh, you know, and so they're they're out there and they're being used. Um, and they've been used in Syria too, so there they are. Staying on the commercial side, uh, just uh, for another moment, though, of course, it's it's hard to make that distinction, isn't it, when respect to China, because we know Chinese corporations. Uh, well, I don't know, compromised or controlled, have a security and intelligence function embedded in them. Yes, usually they do. Yes, so the, the subject is just uh, reviewing the Huawei 5G issue. Yeah. About uh, the warnings the United States gave against uh, uh, Huawei with our NATO allies. Uh, some of them chose to ignore it. That's correct. What are the vulnerabilities that presents? To those who uh, took yeah. it. Well, the vulnerability is, is that the 5G is, of course, the telecommunications, the new telecommunication standard for cellular, high speed cellular uh, communications. But it's much more than that because once you have enabled a network with 5G, it's also a backbone system that can be used like the internet. Um, and it involves your whole PTT. Today, if you have a home telephone, the chances are that that home telephone is is actually running on what they call voice over internet protocol or VOIP. And what, what that means is that the telephone is not hardwired to your to the old way down to the PTT in the center of town and then goes out to the rest of the world. It it's it part of the internet. It's that simple. So if if you're controlling this, this large slug of the internet in a certain country. Let's say the UK, okay, which is our big partner, right? Security-wise, the most important ally the U.S. has, security-wise, or Germany, where we have our NATO forces, right? I mean, uh, it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous because they're on the inside looking out, not on the outside looking in. It, it, it's a very dangerous thing, and I think the U.S. government was right and remains right in really being deeply concerned about Huawei and about the problem that poses because 
Huawei is connected to the People's Liberation Army. And even if it wasn't formally, it would be anyway. It's too, it's too juicy a target for the, for the Chinese to allow to be just in the private sector. This is, this is big time national security stuff. A good deal of attention is paid to China's developing military capabilities, hypersonic missiles. Yes. Uh, their uh, goal of taking out our aircraft carriers are making them move so far out of the region that they can't be effective. Right. Um, however, with the vulnerabilities that something like the Colonial Pipeline represents, or the attempt against the uh, Southern California district water system. Um, the earlier uh, in this, or I think in last May, uh, a ransomware attack against uh, water water treatment facilities in Norway affecting 85% of the population. Right. Vulnerability of our energy electricity grid it could be it could be over before it begins because you well, know, I, mean, I think I, population. look that's all true. Uh, it depends how much damage they could cause and how quickly we could recover from the damage. And I have no idea uh, what the answer is to that, but I would say not immediately. It takes time. Uh, when these things go down, the, the the colonial pipeline was out for well over a week. And you saw the gas prices jump up. <laughs> and naturally, they didn't come down. <laughs> they just jumped up. Um, uh, but they jumped up because people saw delivery of uh, uh, gasoline and, and fuel fuel products under, under assault. And they saw short supply and they saw danger. So then that was only one pipeline. There's a lot of other pipelines. So if they really wanted to push real hard, and I'm not sure where that kind of pushing, where the line is, where instead of just hacking a pipeline, you're, you're hacking a country and the country decides that's an act of war. There's got to be a line there. I mean, there's a point where you can't tolerate this nonsense and you have to treat it as an attack, like any other attack. Well, well, you know, whether it's a missile attack or a cyber attack, if it's devastating enough, it's 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 going to uh, be a national security issue, and not just a nuisance. Well, President Biden uh, purportedly said to uh, Mr. Putin something to that effect. Yeah, but, then he didn't do anything about it. But he didn't do any. So it's yeah. How convincing is that? And uh, the issue of plausible deniability uh, is is uh, there in a way. Well, Putin had two arguments. One, one is I didn't do it. It wasn't me. It was them. You know, these people. But I don't know who they are. Not my problem. It's your problem. That was one argument. But the other problem was, the other, problem, the other point he made, which is just as interesting. He said, well, you're doing this to us all the time. So, I mean, what are you complaining about? You guys are doing it to us. So, if some of our guys are doing it to you, I mean, you know. Well, but when was there when when was there uh, equivalent to the colonial uh, pipeline shutdown? I mean, we don't hear about these things happening in China uh, or Russia. I mean, at least there's Stuxnet hit in Iran from some years ago, but that was really security related, but not of our hitting. The yeah, I mean, but I think we have to answer the you know the our government has to answer the, that argument. So tit for tat. Well, is it tit for tat or, you know, are some of the things we, we do or for our national security that we do? We're not, we're, we're not trying to declare war on Russia, you know, for sure. We're not trying to disrupt Russian, major Russian networks, or television or radio or uh, in, uh, information technology or internet. In fact, it's the Russians who are just tested, by the way, uh, whether they could turn off the external internet, you know, outside of the Russian territory and just maintain an internal internet. And they proved they could do it. Uh, and that's by the way, wartime preparation. That's exactly what it is. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in, in terms of the 
in the years I spent in government broadcasting, we had a mantra that um, the key to success is, um, right, what's the word now that is uh, failing my memory, you know, that you would have alternatives. You wouldn't just have shortwave or longwave, you'd have satellite, you'd have uh, ground uh, uh, broadcast. Well, Multi-layered uh, system. You know, more than uh, one way to reach your audience, particularly if you were in a conflict situation. But it has some problems though, I'll tell you what. Um, you know, the, the Pentagon keeps uh, HF radios, even though it's an old technology, you know, pre-World War II technology, but we, they keep it because it's, it's frequency hopping, you know, jumps around and the, you know, you can, you can, you can make it uh, capable of, of communications, even if they're jamming everything else and knocked off the internet and knocked off the, the telephone system, you know, all that, but you can still communicate. The trouble is that today, the def our defense system is heavily based on highly coordinated and integrated communications, at a very high level of data exchange. Very, you know, from satellites, from aircraft, uh, very high level. Uh, and information dominance is what they talk about in the Pentagon is something that's critical to our ability to, to fight a war. Without it, we will not be successful. And they just did an interesting simulation of a conflict in Asia, the Pentagon did, and they haven't told us too much about it, but they reported that they were very concerned that information dominance was not necessarily possible because the Chinese had the ability to knock out our ability to use data, high-speed data, and, and, and to exchange that information successfully. Now, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but it does suggest that that multi-layer idea, that old idea that you know, you're, the VOA was talking about. And that redundancy. And redundancy is not possible anymore. No. Not possible, at least not now. Maybe in future it will be, but right now it's a real headache. If, if someone can really defeat uh, our capabilities in this area. And again, we're relying on a lot of commercial backbone to make that work. Satellites, not just spy in the sky government satellites, but a lot of our communication satellites that are commercial satellites. Satellites, uh, high-speed internet, this sort of thing. Uh, which could be could be knocked out. Well, I, I always wanted to tell my kids, why don't you take take your cell phone and your computer and lock it in a closet and see how you get along all day? <laughs> they probably won't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> what? No games? No this? No that? Um, but it's you know, government can't get along without out it either, and military for sure can't get along without it. We couldn't do this program without it, that's for sure. That's right. Um, it, let me ask you, you, you seem to indicate earlier when you said the Russians are, they're using the same commercial stuff that we are. Yeah. Uh, and, and purportedly China does and, uh, yeah, perhaps, and does. perhaps Iran and North Korea, I don't know. Yeah, they do. They do. That, well, does, does that mean they they have the same vulnerabilities as we? It does, absolutely. So we could, so. Well, we you're, could you're, you're thinking in the right direction. Oh, yes, sure. <laughs> we, we do know that the North Koreans have become very adept at this. We know purportedly the, the building in Beijing in which uh, uh, the PLA people operate. Yeah. And the names of various Russian groups that, uh, yeah, they have a, a name a day. A name uh, a day. And, um, but we, we don't seem to have any names. In other words, are, are we adept at this kind of thing to act if we need to do so? Do you know? Well, I know that the, uh, the, 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 there's a thing called the Project X in the Pentagon that's supposed to have teams of capable people to do this sort of thing. But since there's no information about it, it's totally classified. I don't know any more about it than anyone else. I mean, it's just it's just not out there, not available. 
But I want to raise mention one other thing. The Chinese, the Chinese are trying to develop their own computer operating systems and to make them unhackable by Western countries, which means mostly the US. Um, I don't know if they've been any good at it, but that's what they're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they think they're vulnerable. They, they think they're very vulnerable. And I think they are too. So I mean, we too can fight this battle, you know. We, uh, this brings up a whole different, well, not different, but a related point. If you're just going to be passive defender, if you're just going to say, okay, I'm going to build, you know, firewalls and all kinds of security layers, and, and that's how I'm going to defend myself, you're surely going to lose. You're surely going to lose. You can't just be a defender. You have to be an aggressor. In other words, you have to hand back some of the pain that we're feeling. First, I'll give you just a simple, stupid thought. Um, they were stealing plans on the F-35. How come we didn't give them bad plans? I mean, really bad plans. So they get up with an airplane with one wing here and one wing down here. And, you know, I mean, it's possible to, because I did it myself in the Pentagon, not the same way, but it's possible to take equipment and modify it, change it. So it doesn't work right, or it does really funny things. Um, that can be done today with electronics, with software, with, with plans, with the, you know, if we had it, if we had a group of people in our government that spent their time screwing the Chinese so they stop hacking us because the stuff they're getting is all bad, that would be very useful. That would really help. And the Russians too. And then the Iranians too. And the North Koreans and all the rest. I mean, we have to be aggressive. And we have to be smart and aggressive. And I don't see any sign of that, unfortunately. Well, Steve, the other thing the Chinese have, as you well know, is a whole of government approach. That's true. So That's if they're true. if they're going to move, everything's going to move. They'll move on the cyber front, the information front, the kinetic front, true. Um, the psyops front, um, taking out our infrastructure, whatever they need to do to achieve victory. And from what you just said to me. Uh, you seem to indicate that the person who gets the jump on the other one uh, is going to win. That's in right. Terms of the, the cyber business. Well, as I said, if we're just going to take a defensive posture, we're going to get we're going to get into increasing trouble and become uh, it's more than being ripped off. We're going to we're going to end up losing losing fights and battles and wars, big time. So, you know, we have an obligation to to take a fresh look at this and then to put together a really aggressive strategy that, that will help us in the future. And you don't have to wait 12 years for a new weapon system. This is not weapon systems. This is, you know, this is creative uh, uh, response to what our adversaries are doing. There's nothing, there's, there's not, I hate to say it's not rocket science <laughs> because rocket science is an issue but but it it's it, it's it's not rocket science in the sense that you know we have this capability we used to have very good and aggressive intelligence capabilities i don't know where they are these days i mean yeah you mentioned we did stux stuxnet well i've forgotten 2001 or something i mean it was a long time ago uh what have you been doing since uh not enough i'm afraid and you know it's allowed China to to essentially leech off us incessantly for a long time, and they're using it to build up their country and to become a strong, a very strong and dangerous, in my opinion, dangerous country. Uh, when I was in the Pentagon, I used to talk about Russians copying the U.S. weapon systems, and you know I had pictures of a Russian thing and an American thing. I said, "Look, they look the same. How come they look the same?" And they looked the same because the Russians copied it. Um, but nowadays, the Chinese are, are beyond, they're copying, but they're going beyond copying. 
and, and they're going beyond copying because they have such tremendous access, not just to the OD, the Defense Department, or the U.S. government, but to our universities, to our intellectual, you know, you know, stuff that's not even stuff yet. It's still in the scientific level, and, and they've sent people into our universities, you know, who who help become part of teams of nanotechnologies. It's one of those fields which is extremely important for future uh, defense systems and future commercial systems, everything. Uh, and the Chinese are deeply involved in, in our universities, Harvard and other places like that. So if you're going to do that, you're going to, you're going to pay a price. It's not going to be very pleasant. Someone like David Goldman thinks that the United States capabilities have already been sufficiently hollowed out by the Chinese, that is the shift of manufacturing and development and uh, so forth to China, that absent a massive national effort, we're not going to make it. Well, David has a point. Uh, I write, as you probably know, I write for Asia Times which Dave is one of the principals. Uh, so we're, we're dialoguing all the time on this, on this subject. Um, look, if you give away most of your manufacturing, then you're in trouble. You have to be in trouble because you've, you've, you've lost your industrial power. And industrial power is part of what makes up national power. I mean, if we had to do what we did in World War II and convert our industry into a wartime industry, we can't do it because we don't have the industry that can do that anymore. We just can't do it. We don't have any, uh, the industrial base isn't there anymore. The workers and the skill base isn't, you know, some time ago, uh, you know, people said you can't get people to make, you know, run machine tools. Now you can't get people to run robots. I mean, it's very hard to get skilled workers and, and to have a skilled workforce and the capability of, of switching over to a, you know, a, a defense uh, a program if you need to. And it, it's, but we've lost almost all of it. And our silicon industry is in trouble too, as you probably know. I believe I saw a figure lately that said the Chinese shipyards today are turning out naval vessels at the rate that the United States did at the height of its production in World War II. I don't know the exact numbers, so I'm, I, I don't know. If, you know, we were building Liberty ships in, in Philadelphia, near in New Jersey, near my hometown, at a very high rate. You know, because we were we had to have convoys carrying stuff to to our allies, and especially the UK, but also to our troops. And so it was a massive, big effort. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, but our shipyards are dead. But that's exactly the point. I think we only have four left that are capable of producing, but in, in not very fast. I mean, not, it, it, not, nothing, nothing uh, compared to the speed with which the Chinese are building uh, naval craft. Yeah, because it takes years to get Congress to appropriate the money. It takes years to get the designs settled down. It takes years to get it all validated, and it goes on. And you know, every stumbling block you can think of, we found it. Well. Despite these uh, very concerning weaknesses that uh, you pointed out, one strength of the United States is that it is in a system of alliances, uh, but that's only as good as uh, uh, what our allies are doing and how much they understand. In those terms, do you see a comparable level of understanding uh, to which you have just put forward here in Great Britain or in Germany and in, in other allied countries, and then in Asia, in, in Japan, New Zealand, Australia. Well, aside from the British, who I think are, are starting to see some light, let's put it that way, and are willing to try and work with us to some extent, the others are, are not. The Germans, Germans are busy building the pipeline. Well, it's almost finished now with the rush of the Nord Stream 2. I mean, they're, they're not interested in defense. The, the German army is a disaster. Um, 
they have very few tanks that even run. Um, you know, they're, they're not really a world power anymore phys- as a military power. Uh, the British army is smaller than it was in 1776. That's, that's, well, we won that war, as I recall. So that, that's probably a good thing. Uh, the Japanese self-defense force is, is very tiny uh, by design. Uh, they spend uh, around 1% of their GDP on, on defense, which is far from adequate, especially now with the challenges they face. And when we asked them to put Aegis Assure, it's an air defense system, the Aegis Air Defense System, in to protect the vital parts of the Japanese mainland, especially the, the air bases and the naval ports where we have our ships and our, our airplanes and our personnel, uh, they, they said yes, and then they changed their mind and said no. So they have no 24-7 full-time strategic defensive system, even in the planning works. They're relying on the Patriot PAC-3 system and some PAC-2s, which are far from adequate and, uh, and, and won't defeat a Chinese attack. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very discouraged. I think right now that uh, trying to get our, whip our allies into shape is not gonna happen unless we whip ourselves into shape. Do you think it's an exaggeration to say we're in a pre-war condition? It smells like the 1930s. As you but, know, a number of admirals and generals have said they expect war with China within five years, that they think the Chinese military is itching for a fight. Uh, I think that's true. I think they are itching for a fight. And in fact, one of the worrisome issues is whether the civilian leadership in China can constrain their military or whether they're gonna be whipsawed into getting into a, a conflict, probably Taiwan, but not necessarily only Taiwan. And they got their eye on the Senkaku Islands, the Japanese islands. I mean, their, their whole strategy is this first island chain in the Pacific that they wanna control it because they figured that way they control Asia. And by the way, they're right. Uh, The Japanese seem to think they're right also, which is why the Minister of Defense recently spoke uh, rather forthrightly, as did his deputy minister, about uh, Taiwan being central to the security. Existentially important to Japan's security. Yeah. And I think that it made the Chinese crazy. (laughs) They were furious. And uh, they put out a video showing that they were gonna nuke Japan, not once, but consistently, continuously nuke Japan because of what they, what the defense, the deputy defense minister said, uh, crazy. But I mean, that's the sort of thing, you know, that didn't come out of, out of the blue. All right. And, and that's scary, that's scary. And irres- reckless, irresponsible. And they said, we're, China has a no first nuclear policy, but it no longer applies to Japan. I mean, can you imagine something like that? Uh, So they threaten Japan with nuclear war. Japan has no nuclear weapons. They're not a nuclear threat to to, uh, China. They just don't have any. But they threaten to to obliterate them, which means obliterating us because we have, you know, our soldiers and our sailors and our our uh, support personnel, lots of them in Japan, not counting all our businessmen and, you know, everybody else. But this kind of threat, it's, it's, off, it's, it's uh, reckless, reckless. But it tells you the mentality of these people and why we have to really take this challenge up. And that's, you know, I'm worried that, that right now we're, we're appeasing China and that the, that's dangerous. It was dangerous when, you know, Chamberlain appeased Hitler. And it's dangerous when Wendy Sherman, the State Department deputy, goes to China and appeases the, the Chinese uh, government. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's, it's very, very... I mean, what are we going to give? We're going to give them Taiwan? We're going to give them the Senkakus? Well, as uh, the Japanese and 
some of our military folks have said it's it's game over at that point. Well, I, I think the Japanese are, are, are feeling the feeling the pressure now, yeah. which is probably a good thing. If they had felt it twenty years ago, it would even been better. But uh, look, we're slow. We're very slow. And uh, I just wrote a piece for Asia Times about how we pulled off our air. We have one aircraft carrier in the Pacific, just one, based in Yokohama. It's a USS Ronald Reagan. And we pulled it out ostensibly to cover the, the uh, Afghanistan withdrawal. But I don't know what purpose it has covering the, the Afghanistan withdrawal. I think we pulled it out to placate the Chinese. So, oh yeah, we also pulled our bombers out of Guam. They're no longer stationed in Guam. They're stationed in the United States. Well, they can get there in a hurry. Well, how many hurries is that? That's a long way off to get a, to fly a B-52, which is a slow flying airplane. And we have no more B-1s right now because they're all in, you know, grounded. Um, and the B-2s are a nuclear mission. We're not going to put them into any conventional conflict. So we've essentially abandoned Guam for all practical purposes. Why? What's wrong with us? Well, I think uh, let's let's leave that to be answered in another program with you. <laughs> I caused enough trouble today. I'm, I'm <laughs> extremely grateful uh, to Dr. Steve Bryan for doing this program with us today on technology security and cyber hyper insecurity, it seems. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us at this program. Please go to the Westminster Institute uh, webpage where you'll see a number of other of our lectures available on video and on our uh, YouTube channel on China, Russia, and a number of other subjects. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Robert Riley. <laughs>